Hello everyone, this is Bobbin Threadbear, and welcome back to the Human Revolution. Now, before I proceeded any further, I figured that I would show you what I had skipped past twice before, which is the sewer system over on the west side here. Now, like I said, this is the most direct route to the basement of the uh, parking garage. But also, like I said, that does not mean it is the easiest way of getting in. There are a couple of paths through here, but there are also a lot of patrolling guards. And even more stationary guards. Who apparently don't have much to say to each other. More's the pity. Uh oh, taking that. Yeah. Finally get to top off my health here. Get blind, stinking drunk at the same time. But yeah, here's the, uh, the door. And now with that little detour out of the way, we'll be able to move on to the next part of the actual game. Oh, but don't think that it wasn't worth it to do all that, by the way. Also, yeah, the door doesn't really isn't really that advantageous compared to the uh, the ventilation shaft. You have talent, Jensen. You ever need a job, you tell me. I'll hook you up. I take it the kid made it back in one piece. He says I owe you a weapon. I always repay my debts with interest. <laughs> Why the hell wouldn't I accept? That's one debt paid. Now tell me what you know. Bell Tower keeps two ships in port. They think nobody notices, but I keep an eye. Every couple of days, one of them loads up in the middle of the night and sails out. Heading where? A wise man doesn't ask. I just know the Hayes and Sue pulls out tonight. And where she make port, I bet you find your scientists. That's a whole lot of maybe, Tong. True. But maybe you lucky more times than I can count. Bell Tower runs tight security. How do you expect me to get on their ship? One of my boys will leave a package inside a locker for you in an equipment shed. You find it, we talk, and I tell you what to do next. I'll be waiting with bated breath, I'm sure. Follow the sewers to the port. Easiest way to get in there undetected. Find that package we planted, because without it, you have no chance. It's in an equipment ship. All right. Oh, crap. This is because I didn't get the upgraded ship. And hey, looks like most of the harvesters didn't either. I guess... They didn't trust the whole uh, spiel either. Hmm. And yeah, that's that's how you get to the port right there. That's how you know that the whole Tong thing was a side mission. And there's not much to the sewers here, except for this weapons dealer. You want some friendly advice? Stay away from the Bell Tower boys patrolling the streets. They're looking for some guy who looks a lot like you. Get it? But don't worry. I'm not going to do those bastards a favor. I never saw you. Cool. Tell me something, Mom. <coughs> Why is it that everyone with Augs got hit by that glitch? Not all augments are made by the same company. They don't all use the same chips. It makes me wonder who's in on this. Lim? Taiyong? The government? Fucking aliens? Shit. What are they planning? Well, the aliens are just, uh, from a crash ship. Ah, you buy or sell? I do it all. Look at a computer and see for yourself. But aside from that, he's right. And it is good to see that at least some people are wary of uh, what's going on with this. That some of these... Uh... Bye bye! Some of the people in the shadows who don't trust the government in the first place... Well, guess what? They don't trust the government now, either. Especially since the government is the WHO, so it's not actually a government. Anyway, grenade launcher. 
<laughs> I got 11 uh, grenades. Yeah, it doesn't use like actual grenades. It's got its own special ammo. But hey, this is going to be fun. Well, as long as the ammo doesn't run out, at least. And yeah, it's going to run out pretty quickly. Well, it should at least give me plenty of fun up here in the port. Hey, we're out from underneath the shadow of the, uh, the Pengu. Alright, so from here we can't get in there, but we can get on top of there. Assuming we get let rid of the electricity, or we have the anti-EMP thing, which I have, but, uh... Let's just forget about that for now. So you can actually get back here, and there are some crates. And I believe you can move the crates underneath the uh, the trailers there. So you can use them as a way to get up if you, you know, you don't have super jump. Anyway, that's one way through. This is the main gate, of course. Well guarded, well monitored. But that's something we can change. That uh, breaker box, that obviously shuts off the electricity, so you can use that one side to get in. And that box I looked at for a brief second there, that is a third way in. Assuming you can move a large box. All right, not going to give me any trouble. Access granted. And from here, I can turn off the camera, open the doors, and set the robots to murder my enemies. Oh, and I've got the password for this. Sentry. And that's one down. Yeah, they, they just don't have enough uh, heavy ordnance to really deal with the robot, but... Uh, they do have enough intelligence, I guess, to set off the alarm. Now that the robot is murdering them all. I yeah, can't really blame them for that. But hey, I shut up the electricity, so let's... Let's go jump over this, uh, yeah. I don't know, fast food joint, I guess. Noodle shop. Oh, yep, yeah, there's the robot. Nobody around here. But, uh, oh. <laughs> and there's two more down. I like how he's getting marksmen for me, too, here. Yeah, there, there was a bright one up there. That was actually a sniper on the roof of that building in the middle. Oh. Looks like he got the, uh, the robot got the attention of some of the guys that are patrolling the lower area on the left there. There's also a lower area on the right. But, uh... Apparently they're a little too far away to you know, get uh, pulled up in the into fighting the robot when it's on the wrong side of the map here. Yeah, I'm just enjoying the, uh, the background there. They got some nice textures around here. Now that we can finally see past the horizon. Out to the horizon. And since the alarm has been set off anyway, I figured I might as well take care of a camera or two. Oh, but there is one other guy. You, you just saw him. And this, uh... This is what makes the, uh, the weapon mod for the tranquilite rifle so good. And speaking of which... But, uh... Yeah, I'm not going to pick it up. 
There, there was that one guy downstairs, but I'm not going to go back for him. Just, just to sell something like this. And I'm not going to meet another weapons dealer for a, a long time. Like, maybe you guessed from the fact that uh, Malik could have died when we got here, but we are not going to be taking the helicopter back to Detroit ever again. Like, that is how this works, you know. Access granted. All right. Yep, camera failure. Oh, turrets. Let's set those to murder my enemies. Nah, I don't need a concussion grenade. Losses. This is why I was checking bodies earlier. They've got a lot of personal secretaries. Pocket secretaries. I keep mixing that up. Pocket secretaries with passwords on them. And access codes. Hmm. Sounds like the alert finally ended. And yeah, there's one more guy down there. Let's see if I can nail him from here. Oh, sweet. I did. Yeah, when I did the practice run, I uh, had some trouble zeroing in with the, uh, with the grenade launcher here. Two shots per person, you know, kind of embarrassing. But hey, that's what the practice is for, you know. To find out where everything is ahead of time, and to learn how to use the weapons I have been given. Huh. Shooting at something. Ah, pistol ammo. Still feeling like I don't have enough of that. Even though I... looks like I do. So, what have we got here? Oh, easy. Yeah, just gotta go straight for the stack this time. Oh, the alarm is going off again. Access granted. Or just stopped. Am I stopping it by using these computers? I mean, I know you can do that with the alarm panels, but I wasn't aware that you could do it with security computers. Ah, huh. I guess I didn't. It just... It just stopped making noise for a little while, that's all. Oh. Lots of combat rifle ammo around here. Oh, pocket secretary. Access code. Ah, oh, crap, that's a revolver. Another access code. For storage unit B. Yeah, maybe it never stopped the first time either. Maybe it's just I keep walking too far away from the sirens. They do seem a little bit quieter. But yeah, that was me checking all the bodies just to see if anyone had a the uh, the password for this. But apparently they don't. But it's fine because this is another one of the easy ones. Access granted. Ah, storage unit A. Go for 300. And they're talking about cargo as if it could escape. Which, yeah, is not a good sign. And also as if they, uh, they weren't sure that this cargo is the kind of cargo that they, that they want to move. That sort of thing. And, uh, you know, actually it's it's not even that big of a secret. I mean, Tong was telling you that Bell Tower is grabbing people off the streets of Hengsha. And they are tearing off their augmentations to give to him as a bribe for ignoring this fact. Anyway, that, of course, is the way forward, but I'm not interested in that. 
I've got quite a bit left to explore out here on the dock loading grounds, whatever. Looks like I'm just about done with the, uh, the upper area here, though. Just got this left portion to check through. Ugh. The uh, building here, of course. It's got a window that you can open, but before I go in there, there are a couple things in this little area here. That combat rifle I apparently missed. Which reminded me, apparently. Yeah, I think there's supposed to be something in that little area there, but maybe I was hallucinating. Oh! Maybe this is what I was thinking of. Silent sniper rifle. Yet another. Alright, but with that being done, I believe I can enter this central room here. For some reason that garage door doesn't open, but you can get up top here. Which is where the sniper died. And the sniper has a warehouse balcony code. That's actually where I, uh, the sniper I knocked out is. That's where that guy's standing. And let's get in through the window here, even though the front door is open. Not even a lock here or anything. It's just open. That's just a stealth entrance, you know. Hey, I guess the alarm must have ended because that uh, alarm panel there was green. I guess it does shut off on its own eventually. Now, there are two ways into this room, but one of them is harder to get through than the other. And I think this is a one. Yeah, it looks like it's a level one, so it's, you know, not even that big a deal. Granted. Yep, this is where we need to be. You sure could teach my boys some tricks, Jensen. Tong? How did you get this frequency? Ancient Chinese secret. Now listen, you're going to plant that package in Administrator Wang's office. Put it on the bastard's desk and trigger it. Sound good? Sounds like I'm doing you a favor. How does it help me? The explosion should distract the guards. Then you hop in a cargo pod and off you go. But you only got one shot. No turning back once you trigger that thing, you get me? I got you. Only set it if I'm ready to go. Well, can't really make a point of no return clearer than that. And you can double back to Hangsha, even at this point. I mean, by now there's nothing left to do. But, you know, maybe I've uh, been procrastinating on that uh, side quest. Access granted. And yeah, all those access codes and this one I still have to hack. Well, at least I turned off a camera here. And th I don't have to hack this one either. Huh. Ooh, more grenades. Well... One more grenade. Yeah, this is definitely a gimmick weapon because, well, the, the heavy rifle ammo doesn't really... It's hard to find enough heavy rifle ammo to keep it fed. It chews through it so fast. But this, it's, it's hard to find it outside of these two areas. For the grenade launcher, I mean. At least from what I recall. I can tell you this, you will not find more ammunition for the grenade launcher in hours to come in the, uh, the director's cut. And hey, yeah, that's the turret I set to friendly. And here's something else I've got to hack. And it's level four, too. You know, it's not the difficulty that gets to me, it's the fact that I found so many numbers and none of them are for this. 
implies that there are so many more numbers to find. Access granted. All right. Ooh, rocket launcher. Now that's something you can find ammo for. And that's something that takes up even more space than the grenade launcher. Ah, finally. These coats are coming in handy. Hmm, damage upgrade. Nice. So, what do I gotta drop? Hmm. Oh, crap, that's right. I gotta use that mine template. Hmm. Between that and the shotgun... I suppose the shotgun could use it more. I mean, it does a lot of damage, but it the, the damage drops off really fast. It's kind of interesting that you can get back here, by the way, even though there's nothing back there at all. I guess Jensen's just a sort of a nimble guy. Ah, here we go again. These are the cargo areas, by the way. Rate of fire upgrade. That is definitely shotgun, because combat rifle is already a, a high-speed weapon. It doesn't really need rate of fire that much. Not like the shotgun does. Certainly not that. But hey, what have we got here? Ventilation duct that lets me into the basement area. But not just any basement area. The one that gets rid of the poo gas. Now I can go anywhere down here, instead of just one or two places. Or, you know, that would be my restriction if I didn't also have the, uh... The aug that... the, the rebreather aug that lets me, uh, ignore poo gas. But yeah, I just wanted to show you how to do that. So in case you were wondering, that robot downstairs was on a different circuit, I guess, than the one upstairs, because that would have been hostile, even if I hadn't uh, met it with a grenade. And hey, yeah. Two shots and I killed it. I am much better at aiming this thing than I did, than I was the, uh, the first time around. Huh, here's the other exit. And that's just underneath the, the turret there, by the way. That's a, a reason why you might not want to take that way in. Aside from the poo gas. But yeah, it's a deceptively simple layout down here. It's just easy to get lost in because all the corridors look the same. And that manhole there, that ladder... That was the way to get up into the, uh, the room with the explosive. Yep, just like so. As I was saying. I think you can break the glass to get in, too, but obviously that's, uh, that's got its problems, because it alerts everybody around. Oh, I got the code for this. Alright, that lets me into this office here adjacent to the area we want to go to. But before we actually go in there, we've got this rather complicated hack to handle. I mean, it, it looks more complicated than it is, but it's also still kind of complicated. See, we're already done. Access granted. Nice. All right, now here, here are the dock employees who are concerned about uh, what Bell Tower has been doing at their dock. List of departures: Heizen Zoo. That's the one we're looking for. That's the one we're hoping to sneak on board. I 
kind of want either of those. Alright, security hub. Hopefully this will take care of that camera just outside. But hey, easy mode. Access grant. Well, that takes care of two cameras. But I'm not actually going to be going in through that door. That door is the lame door. I'm going to ignore that door. Instead, I'm going to go up to the balcony here. We've got the security guard and knocked out. And then killed. And now up here, we've got the superior way in. Well, actually, we've got two ways in from here. Because go up this one final ladder here. We'll be able to get onto the rooftop, and from the rooftop, we've got the skylight. And with the skylight, we've got uh, one breakable glass panel that, if we have Icarus, will let us jump down into the middle of everything, and is kind of a bad idea, because everybody sees you falling down there. So if you prefer, you know, at least a little stealth, you can go in through the side here. <laughs> that being said, uh, clearing out the warehouse here with a grenade launcher turned out to be harder than I thought it would be. You may have noticed that cut just now. Oh! Cyber Boost Pro Energy Jar. I'll take that. And I will equip the EMP grenade. And for some reason, my uh, bars unstacked. It's kind of annoying. Anyway, why did I need an EMP grenade? Simple. For the same reason I didn't go in through the skylight. I... Maybe that big boy there wouldn't have shown up if I hadn't set off the alarm. But I did. And now they know where I am. And so this becomes hard. God damn it. Now I don't know how to aim with this thing. And in case you're wondering why I'm popping up like this instead of, you know actually using the hide-behind-cover mechanic. That's because if I do that, half the grenades will hit me in the face. I do not want half the grenades to hit me in the face. Therefore, I am playing Whack-A-Mole as the Mole. The Mole with a grenade launcher. There we go. All right, grenade launcher's out of ammo, so let's, uh... Combat rifle. And I was going to say something else, but that was the last guy. And, uh, I don't need to kill anybody else. With the combat rifle. Today. Right, looting bodies. Machine pistol ammo. Bitch. Combat rifle ammo, that's a bit better. Replace all five bullets I lost. Hmm. Nobody's back here. Oh. But there is a turret upstairs. I should do something about that. Interesting pods they've got here. Hmm. Damn it, I don't want to pick up the concussion grenade. I want to pick up the credit chip. Alright, port security. This is one of those weirdly shaped ones. Luckily, this is still easy mode here. Access granted. Alright, 
Turrets, my friend. Camera is off. That's that. Now I can finish searching the bodies here. Get some credits, shotgun shells. Ignore the machine pistol stuff. What about your weapon? How far away did you fly from it? I cannot tell. So over here, this is the uh, ground level entrance. And up here, two guys I got with one grenade. Huh. And that guy definitely went flying. Ah, office code and a password. So if you don't want to deal with that turret and you don't want to hack it or whatever, it is possible to use those boxes as cover to sneak up here. Heavy ammo there. And from here, you can use that ventilation shaft to get past the turret. And the two people patrolling this area. Incidentally. Hmm. Alright, now let's see what that... Uh... Oh, yeah. Can't forget to get rid of that. It's not really going to come in handy ever again. But it was fun while it lasted. It was that. Access granted. Nice. Ah, yes. Now here you have it. Crystal clear. Those giant ass pods are for human abduction. And Bell Tower is threatening the employees with abduction if they don't let them do what they want. And that's why I was in kill mode for everybody in the docks here. Because they are up to their knees. Why did I say knees and then point to my nose? Why am I saying I pointed to my nose when you can't see me anyway? Access granted. There are some weird mysteries in life, I tell you. Ah, oh, yeah. And uh, apparently someone is miffed some of those cargo containers, so to speak, have faulty life support systems. Which, you know, is kind of bad news for everybody involved. Ah, finally. Main man. <laughs> Bad choice. The hive master is not at all pleased with Mr. Wong. And this is how he shows that displeasure. By having some Random Guaylo put an explosive packet on his desk. On his completely empty desk. Hmm. Oh well. It's going to be empty either way at this point. Shit! <laughs> well, go figure. Turns out Tong still doesn't like Jensen. It's not really a double cross, because he could have set it to one second. It's more like Tong didn't care what happened to Jensen. And why, you ask? Not just to blow up that one guy's office. Oh no. 
There's one other thing going on here. <coughs> so that distraction wasn't just for me, was it, Tom? Without that extra little mission, that would be the first and last time we see Tracer Tong. Richard, I'm going off the grid for a while. Not sure how long. Why? What are you up to, Jensen? Following a lead. And where exactly is this lead taking you? You there! Get that cargo, clear the fire! We're pulling out now! Load it, secure those pods! Answer me, Jensen. Where are you going? Hell if I know, Pritchard. Hell if I know. So, it's time once again to head to Science Corner to pick apart an aspect of Human Revolution's future. Today's examination will be of mobile technology. But before I get into all that, I'd like to begin by explaining how mobile technology became a thing in the first place. Miniaturization. Here's the funny thing about miniaturization. It's never the direct goal of the people doing the research and development. Now, don't get me wrong. Researchers can certainly want to create a smaller computer component, but it's never that easy to pull off. It's not like architecture, where you can build a scale model using the same materials as a full-size building. You can't create a smaller transistor by using an existing transistor diagram and shrinking it you have to make a completely new transistor that just so happens to be smaller. And hell, even a scale model can't represent everything about a full-size building. The invention of the crystal transistor was a part of the miniaturization process. I've discussed this before, but crystal transistors replaced vacuum tube transistors, and they were smaller, less fragile, and they didn't need a heat source. The energy and space savings of crystal transistors and diodes allowed manufacturers to create radios so small you could carry them around with you, as opposed to the early radios that were more of a piece of furniture than an appliance. These new radios were aptly named transistor radios, and they were all the rage in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. One good way to look at the progress of miniaturization over the past century is to examine the pacemaker. It's also on point with human revolution, since pacemakers are our first real experiments with cybernetics. Pacemakers are medical implants given to patients who suffer from cardiac arrhythmia, or a heart that doesn't beat on time. The exact nature and reasons behind this condition can vary from person to person, but the results are always the same. A serious risk of cardiac arrest and death. We've known for a long time that electric shocks to the heart can get it beating on time again, and so it came up when we realized that sometimes the heart's natural pacemaker malfunctions and needs an artificial replacement. For a long time, all we could really do was watch as people with bum tickers keeled over and died. But around 90 years ago, the Australian Mark Lidwell and the American Albert Hyman independently created the first external pacemakers. Lidwell used alternating current and a needle in the heart to induce a regular rhythm, while Hyman's device used DC power to do the same thing. However, physicians at the time thought that electric stimulation was quackery, and so it would take another 20 years for the first real, long-term pacemakers to show up. Pacemakers were reinvented in 1949 when a couple of Canadians, Wilfred Bigelow and John Callaghan, experimented with using hypothermia to perform heart surgery. They were having trouble getting the heart to start again afterwards, hence the need for a device. The first true pacemakers were bulky boxes full of vacuum tubes that connected to the heart through a couple of cardiovascular catheter electrodes implanted in the veins. Naturally, they weren't exactly portable and patients couldn't have it running 24-7, but it helped when patients went through arrhythmia episodes and it would also lead to defibrillators, those paddles that zap your chest. 
Fortunately, crystal transistors already existed by this point, so in 1957, Earl E. Bakken founded Medtronic in Minneapolis and developed the first truly portable pacemaker. A surgeon in the area had recently created a steel wire coated in Teflon that resisted rejection, and Bakken connected it to, essentially, an early transistor metronome. The box was about as big as a transistor radio and had two giant cords leading to the heart, but hey, at least you could leave the hospital with it. The first implantable pacemaker came just one year later thanks to a desperate patient in Sweden. It didn't work very well, but the fact that it worked at all, and it was small enough to fit inside the chest cavity, was kind of amazing. The patient even survived and died only in 2001 from an unrelated condition. By 1960, the first mass-produced implantable pacemakers were spreading throughout America. They did have some problems, though. Batteries would leak, leads would snap, and most importantly, the wired terminals would get coated in scar tissue and stop working. That's essentially the same problem facing brain implants today. The solution at the time was to stitch the electrodes directly to the surface of the heart and use a pair of induction coils to connect them to an external pacemaker, which you could put in your breast pocket. This was the state of the art into the 1970s. In the 70s, Medtronic, again, created an implantable lithium battery that lasted five years and came in a rejection-resistant titanium case. In the 1980s, medical engineers added a motion sensor to pacemakers, so patients wouldn't have to manually adjust the rate up when they went jogging. In the 90s, pacemakers came with microchips and algorithmic programs that more intelligently predicted how fast the heart needs to beat at any given moment. In the years since the new millennium, pacemakers have been getting smarter and their batteries are lasting longer and new pacing techniques make them more reliable and less vulnerable to scar tissue. But what we have now, as of 2016, is a pill-sized implant that you can inject into a leg vein and which attaches to the inside of the heart wall. No electrode leads required, and you can adjust the programming wirelessly. Precursor Technology Mobile phone technology is closely linked to wireless communication, which I discussed during Internet Corner. However, there's more to it than what I said then, and there's a lot of overlap between mobile phones and our understanding and exploitation of radio waves. The first mobile communication devices were probably the backpack radios Allied soldiers humped around during World War II. The backpacks were heavy, had a limited range, didn't have much of a battery, and they couldn't send and receive signals simultaneously, but they did help coordinate the front. Just after the war, AT&T introduced the mobile telephone service using similar technology. It only worked within a few cities and on a few highways. There were only a few channels, and callers could interrupt each other by moving closer to the receiver, and the mobile phones were only mobile by comparison, since rigs weighed 80 pounds. But hey, it worked. In 1964, AT&T came out with the improved mobile telephone service. The mobile phones that used these systems were small enough to fit in a suitcase, and more sophisticated switching boards meant that you could place direct calls instead of going through an operator. Unfortunately, there were still limits on the frequency bands, so AT&T could only allow so many subscribers at once. Towards the end, you'd have to wait three years to get a mobile phone subscription, and a lot of the bandwidth was getting eaten up by pagers. This state of affairs is why phone companies started building cellular towers. But about that thing I just mentioned, pagers. Pagers are sort of an antecedent to text messaging services, a device that can't send or receive phone calls, but which does light up if someone calls its number. Initially, they could only tell you that someone wanted to contact you, but over time, they started showing the phone number of the person trying to contact you. They could receive text messages, and eventually you could use them to send text messages, too. 
although in the beginning you could only select certain messages from a list. Of course, pagers have gone out of style since the mobile phone really took off, mostly because a modern phone can do everything a pager ever could. Still, you can find them around here and there. Ever been to a restaurant that handed you a plastic disc that started flashing when your table was ready? That's a pager. But now, let's move on to the main event. The Incredible Shrinking Phone The first modern mobile phone, the first device you hold up to your ear without needing a suitcase or a car, was a Motorola prototype built in 1973. It weighed around two and a half pounds, its battery gave you 30 minutes of conversation, and then you had to wait 10 hours for it to charge back up. Just over 10 years later, in 1984, Motorola came out with the Dynatac 8000X, the first commercial cell phone. And in that decade of development, they added an LED display that remembered up to 30 phone numbers and otherwise had pretty much the same stats as the prototype. Oh, and it cost $4,000, which is about $9,500 in today's money. Even so, the waiting list had thousands of names on it. It wasn't long before the Finnish company Nokia entered the fray with the Mobira Cityman 900. This phone was a featherweight one and a half pounds, and it represented the first step of what would be a mobile giant, up until the smartphone era. They tied their fortunes to the Windows Phone OS, and let's just say things didn't turn out well. But back in the 90s, Nokia's brick phone design was setting the standard for phone size and functionality. Later models, like the Nokia 6110, added features like a calculator, a clock, a calendar, a pager function, and a currency converter. Nokia brought video games to phones by including the game Snake. In 1997, Motorola came out with the StarTac, world's first flip phone. The shape was deliberately inspired by the communicators in the original Star Trek series, and it meant phones could be even smaller and thinner. Not to be outdone, Nokia sold the first camera phone in America in 2003, the 3600. Meanwhile, there's another ancestor to the modern smartphone I should mention, and that's the PDA. PDA stands for Personal Digital Assistant, and the name comes from the way it could organize your schedule and offer reminders for birthdays and meetings, and so forth. Even the shape of the original PDA resembles the modern smartphone. The first PDA generation was the Palm Pilot, developed by Palm Computing in 1996. The screen was green and black, but you could use a stylus to interact with it, it could kind of read letters you drew in the space at the bottom, and you could add apps by plugging the pilot into your computer and downloading some off of Palm's website. Later devices added color screens, a touch interface, more buttons, and the ability to make phone calls. BlackBerry was one of the early pioneers of PDA cell phone convergence, and in 2003, their 5810 PDA could handle email and phone calls, among other things. The other big convergent portable device is the MP3 player, which is how Apple entered the field. The MP3 format established itself in 1996, and it allowed for CD-level quality in a fraction of the space. Thus, by 1998, people started to switch from CDs to MP3 players. The first successful MP3 player was the Diamond Rio PMP300, and it was about the same size and shape as a deck of cards. It cost $200, and it could hold exactly 32 megabytes. And let me just open a random album here. Let's see. Properties. Ah, Billy Joel's Greatest Hits, Volume 3, takes up 135 megabytes. Modern MP3s aren't as compressed, since we have the room to spare, but I think you get the problem with the first generation here. In 2001, Apple produced the first iPod, which cost $400, but could hold 5 gigabytes of songs. 
Initially, it was an accessory for Apple's computers. Since it only worked with iTunes, and iTunes only came on Macintosh computers. But it wasn't long before Apple realized they had a hit on their hands, and subsequent generations added more space, more sophistication, more compatibility, and video playback. In 2003, iTunes opened a music store. Although the DRM protections on the songs meant that they were a real hassle to copy, reuse, and port over to a new computer. That's why I get my music from Amazon, even though iTunes did change its ways in 2009. In 2007, Apple created the iPod Touch, an MP3 player with a touchscreen interface that they would later use for the iPhone, and which looks distinctly like a then-contemporary PDA. Thinking back, it was probably the addition of music playback that made the modern smartphone take off like it did. When a single handheld device could make calls, send texts, take pictures, do everything a PDA could do, play games, play music, and play videos, well, who wouldn't want one of those? I'm a tech procrastinator. Even I've got an iPhone 5 now. Modern mobile technology offers even more tools and more form factors. A gyroscope that detects motion and angle. A magnetic compass you can use to turn your phone into a stud finder or a metal detector. A second camera on the face for video chat and selfies. A durable case that can handle water immersion and drops onto concrete. Then there's the tablet computer for when you need a bigger screen, and the smartwatch for when you need something conveniently on your wrist. Smartwatches can also check your pulse and act like a Fitbit. And if there's something a smart device can't do, all you need to do is buy a Bluetooth-enabled accessory, and you'll be set. Thanks for joining me again today in Science Corner. I hope I'll see you next time for another cyberpunk predecessor. This one is about hate. 387.44 million miles of hate.